This is the story of a catamaran sailboat that began as a boat in a box. The story has its origins in the mists of time when the ancient Polynesians explored the oceans on watercraft consisting of two dugout canoes lashed together with crossbeams and powered by sails made of lahala leaves. This story's origins are also more contemporary. Fast forward to 1956, when a brash and daring young Englishman chose to build his own double canoe and sail across the Atlantic in the company of two young women. This was much to the astonishment of Europeans who had yet to develop an appreciation of the Polynesians. It was also to the consternation of the British sailing aristocracy who believed that the only seaworthy vessel was a staunch monohull. James wrote about their crossing to North America and back to Europe in a 1969 book, Two Girls, Two Catamarans, which is now into its fourth printing and still available. James Warren went on to design catamarans in sizes ranging from 14 feet to 63 feet. He has sold plans around the world, much to the delight and devotion of many multi-hull sailors who have built and who sail his designs. Since the earliest warm design boats began to show up around the world, a community of enthusiasts has formed people who have a passion for these boats. Whenever and wherever they meet, they share ideas and experiences with each other. Check out this awesome Tiki 38, Lucky Fish Gets Away. The owners, Stuart and Zaya, are a wonderful example of the generosity and camaraderie which is so much part of the Warham sailing community. They share their knowledge and experiences widely through their blog posts and their video channel. very fortunate to be a member of such a wonderful community and have been for many years. My first boat building project was a Tiki 21. It is a design that has been extremely popular with over a thousand sets of plans sold and hundreds of the model built and sailing. My Tiki 21 was launched on a Canadian prairie lake in 1999. I sailed it there for three summers and shared some great times with family and friends. In 2001, I moved to Ghana, West Africa, and took the boat with me. When I moved back to Canada in 2010, I left the boat behind. On the 60th anniversary of Warham's Atlantic crossing on the 23 and a half foot Tangaroa, his first boat, James and his partner, Hannah Kaboon, introduced a new design, the Mana 24, with the same length as the original Tangaroa. James Worm not only drew on the design features of the Polynesian sailors, but he also used Polynesia as a source for many of the names of his designs, including this new one. The name Mana refers to power and life force of something living or non-living. The prototype MANA was launched in August of 2016. The name this wine vessel MANA. Worms announced that the new design would be available in a kit form. I'd been following the production of the prototype and decided that this new design would be a replacement for my Tiki 21. I placed my order early in 2017 and was told that mine was a second order for the new design, thus giving my boat the number three designation. The plywood components for number three were cut out on the CNC cutter in May. Hanukkah sent me photos of the process. She also sent photos of the contents to be loaded into the shipping crate. Plywood components were bagged in appropriate groups 
And of course, there were many other parts, including lines, hardware, and sales. It was time for me to get prepared. This involved modifying a friend's boat trailer at his request so that it could double as a utility trailer. On July 19th, I drove to the Calgary International Airport to take delivery of a crate measuring approximately four feet by eight feet by two feet, a boat in a box. While waiting for the kit to be shipped, I set about gathering up items for the project. I was unable to find a local supplier for the specified lumber and I made a trip to Edmonton for that. The aluminum tubing used for the masts were a special order item collected in the north end of Saskatoon and transported rather precariously on my truck to our home in the south side. Of course, woodworking requires tools, some of which I already had, but many I didn't. By shopping for good used equipment and for specials, I soon had what I felt would be required. It was time to start work even though I still did not have a workshop large enough for the project. Throughout much of September, when not harvesting garden produce, I started putting things together. Bulkheads and bunks needed reinforcing. Soon I had enough pre-assembled components to set up the keel and the first three bulkheads of the starboard hull. You know how sometimes things come together at the last minute, like they were destined to work. Serendipity smiled on me in the waning days of September, and a workshop space became available. It had everything going for it, heat and light and a nice working environment. As a bonus, it was a brief walking distance from home. With the help of my sailing buddy, Daryl, I moved in on October 7th. It wasn't long before a boat began to take shape. For those who are not familiar with modern boat building, it is not the same process it once was. James Warham Designs incorporates many new methods of building that reduce the time required to build, they save money in the process, and make it possible for people with only basic carpentry skills to build a boat. This includes the extensive use of marine plywood as well as epoxy to seal the wooden components and to glue them together. Clearly a 24 foot boat is going to require boards and plywood much longer than what would normally be available. Scarfing is often used to lengthen lumber and this was used on the Mana 24, joining two 12 foot lengths together to make up each of the shear stringers. An innovation which was new to me was used to join three lengths of plywood together for each section of the hulls. The jigsaw puzzle joints are possible because of the accuracy of the computer-directed cutting of the panels. The process is straightforward enough. The epoxy mixture is added to the matching surfaces of the puzzle joint and then are sandwiched between smooth surfaces covered with sheet plastic and weighed down while the epoxy sets. With the long panels formed, another innovative method is incorporated. Tabs on the ends of bulkheads are fed through pre-cut slots in the panels and temporarily held in place with wedges while the epoxy mixture sets up. Then zip ties are used to draw the edges of the panels together. In very little time, the hull is sheathed in plywood. At this point, the hulls have taken on the design shape, and now that shape needs to be strengthened. This is accomplished by the use of fillets applied at intersecting joints. By the time a boat has com been completed, the builder has become quite accomplished in the process of applying fillets. Boat building is not all fun and play. There are times that are more satisfying than others. I remember the sense of awe I felt as I applied the top cabin pieces of the first hull. The outer sides of the cabin top sweep around the length of the boat, giving it a very sleek and aerodynamic profile. I knew I was going to have a boat that would turn heads at the marina.
Catamaran construction offers advantages not available to those who choose to build monohulls. Once the first hull has taken shape, it acts as an incentive to see the second one follow suit. As well, any uncertainties that were encountered with the first hull have been overcome and the second hull proceeds with greater ease. It's always nice to share the experience of construction, especially with those who are closest to us. From time to time during the winter, my partner dropped in to make sure that I wasn't making too many mistakes. Her visit also gave me a chance to demonstrate the considerable space there is to stretch out inside the hulls. The bunks are a full six and a half feet long, with storage underneath them. There's not enough room for two people, but it is quite adequate for one. Three port windows allow visual access to the outside. Later in the build, I had another visitor, someone who was very special to me, my mother. Mom came to make sure I was keeping out of trouble and doing the work correctly. It was a special day for me. I didn't keep track of dates when different stages of the build were reached. Each day's work was its own goal and time passed quickly. When the cabin tops were completed, rounding corners and filling gaps was next in preparation for fiberglassing. There was a sense of accomplishment when that stage was reached. Now let me say that boat building requires many skills from the builder, some of which one might have had little previous experience. Fiberglassing was just that skill for me and I was not looking forward to it. I set up a temporary table recycled from the side panels of the shipping crate. The fiberglass is supplied in a big roll along with cutting patterns to ensure the most efficient use of the fiberglass. Once again, I recruited my sailing buddy Daryl to tackle the first cabin top. As might be expected, the first go at the job was a mixed result, but we did get the job done. With the lessons learned from the first cabin, I enlisted the assistance of my partner Lily for the second one and things went much better. With the cabin tops fiberglassed, it was time to roll the hulls. Once again, I enlisted the help of my sailing buddy, Daryl, along this time with his roommate, Mikey. With the hulls up, it was easy to fill gaps and sand. Once that was completed, Daryl and I applied the fiberglass. This time, the glassing procedure went much better. Each of the hulls was completed in a long day. Now it's time to fare the hulls. This process can be never ending if one is not reminded of the real purpose of building the boat in the first place, and that is to go sailing, not to create a pair of perfectly formed hulls. Each builder has to set their own level of finish, and once that has been reached, call it quits with the sanding and get on with the priming. The choice of paint and primer was a difficult one. I ultimately decided to use System 3 products, starting with their waterborne epoxy primer. Five coats went on each hull, and then it was time to work on the cabin tops again. At this point in the build, I decided to change my approach. While continuing to prepare the cabin tops for primer and paint, I started working on other components. The crossbeams were a big job requiring time for epoxy to set at each of many little steps until they could be covered by fiberglass. One error in particular caused me some lost sleep, but I managed to resolve it. And just for some excitement, during the last coat of epoxy on the second crossbeam, I ran out of 205 hardener. That sent me rushing to the north end of the city to get a tiny can of 
205 Hardner, the only one in town. I returned just in time to mix enough epoxy and continue before the earlier batch was cured. The gaffs and tillers were fun to build using jigs to get the required shapes. I also got started on the motor mountain. When working on tillers and gaffs, I was also working on hatches and hatch openings. Multitasking when building with epoxy is necessary to make the best use, not only of time, but also of epoxy. Many steps require small batches, which are not practical to mix up. So it is necessary to have several jobs prepared and ready before mixing. The sense of satisfaction builds as various components take shape and are added. The incentive of seeing each step realized keeps one focused on the larger project to see it to completion. With cabin tops primed, the next major step was painting. And like so many steps along the way, this came with its own hiccups. The day that I started painting was so warm outside, I decided to open the overhead door to enjoy some fresh air. I applied three coats of paint on the first hull before I realized that it was a big mistake. The high temperatures outside, along with the very dry atmosphere, caused the paint to dry before it could flow out, leaving ridges in the paint. I sanded off most of that first hull and started over, this time with the doors closed, and the results were much better. There were other glitches to be encountered. While distracted one day, I reversed one piece of the mast base, requiring me to cut it off and glue it down again. On the second try, another glitch occurred. This time, I did not have a retaining nut embedded sufficiently in epoxy, and one of the four bolts holding the mast base down could not be tightened. Off it came again, and back together, but not without some colorful language to accompany it. What a process. Yes, one process after another. After the priming, there was the painting process. And then painting the non-skid process. And then applying the bottom paint process. And installing the port windows process. And preparing a trailer process. And may you get the drift. About this time, a new recruit came along to help out. My son, Akwesi, along with his family, visiting from their home in West Africa. And finally, it was time to call once again on Daryl and Mikey and my neighbor across the back alley. We did a partial cross beam and center platform assembly in the garage and then set the hulls onto the trailer. Many people who have built a boat can tell you that the last two days of little things to be finished can drag into a much longer time. Amongst those little things included the masts, which had yet to be assembled, and the rudders, which had yet to be lashed on. With masts assembled and rudders attached, it was off to the lake almost losing one of the four hatches a few miles down the road. After we got to the lake, Aquasi took on the task of installing vinyl graphics, which in turn introduced to onlookers the name of the boat and an explanation of the Celtic background for the name. We also discovered another glitch. The motor mount box was not long enough and required a temporary fix before we could launch the boat. Throughout the winter, when asked, I had set a self-imposed deadline for the launch date, saying the boat would be in the water before my 70th birthday. Well, I missed that date, but only by a few days. We had some welcome assistance when my nephew Jeremy showed up for the occasion, and my daughter-in-law recorded the event for us.
Although it was our first time, and the boat ramp was not quite deep enough, the launch went reasonably well, and the requisite champagne was used to christen the Prairie Mermaid. The boat was no longer in a box, it was now on the water. I express my gratitude to all who helped to make it possible. Designers James Warham and Hannah Kaboon and their team, my partner Lily, my very good friend Daryl and his roommate Mikey, my son and nephew. I also acknowledge the interest and encouragement I received from members of the Warham sailing community and others who followed my progress throughout the winter. The Prairie Mermaid is outside the box and I look forward to many adventures. Fair winds.